My name is Michael Rebell. I'm the executive director of the Campaign for Educational Equity, um, which is um, sponsoring this event. Uh, our campaign is um, a policy center here at Teachers College, uh, which uses legal scholarship, research, policy analysis, and public engagement uh, to promote the um, rights of all children, and especially those from disadvantaged backgrounds, to meaningful educational opportunities. And in that vein, we are really proud and excited to present this evening's performance to you. Uh, this is a performance of the play known as 10467, which is a zip code, and you'll understand in a few minutes uh, what the reference to the zip code is. Um, <clears throat> these students have all been working with the Epic Theater Company, and um, we, do, we managed to join our legal policy and public engagement expertise uh, with the artistic brilliance and lived experience uh, of these students and those who have been mentoring them. Um, what happened is our research and public engagement team um, <clears throat> helped these public school students uh, understand and learn what their rights are under the state constitution, under the state laws, and they quickly grasped the fact that not all these rights are being honored and not all of these rights are being implemented. Uh, so they got very interested in this. They went out and we introduced them to members of the regents, one of whom uh, is here, I'm pleased to say, uh, members of the governor's staff, the New York City Department of Ed, uh, and they really learned for themselves the facts about what's going on with funding for schools, uh, with dealing uh, with the myriad problems of providing meaningful opportunity uh, to, these, uh, to, to, to themselves and to their peers. Um, I actually saw two earlier performances of this play, and each time was more exciting than the previous time. So I think you're really, really in for a treat. Um, this occasion marks the 10th year that our uh, campaign has been here at Teachers College. And um, one of the reasons that we've had such a fruitful and productive time during these 10 years is the interest and the support that we've gotten throughout uh, from our president of Teachers College, Susan Furman. And I'm very pleased that Susan's with us tonight and she's gonna to say a few words uh, by way of introduction. Uh, and uh, then we'll ask uh, Joe Rogers, who's our public engagement person who reached out to these students uh, to just give you a little background on it. And then we'll be getting into the show, Susan. So, thank you so much, Michael. It's a pleasure to welcome, all, welcome you all this evening. Uh, I know that you know that from its start, Teachers College has been driven by a deep and abiding commitment to social justice, and educational equity and financing equity are at the heart of social justice. And on a personal note, when I was a student at TC in the long ago, 1970s, uh, working uh, with Donna Shalala, my advisor. Our study of education policy was focused on school financing, and it was at the start of the school finance reform movement, which we felt during those years of the 70s, we, we contributed a great deal to. And uh, today, if there is a movement to bring equity to school finance, it's because of Michael Rebell and continuing in that tradition of TC leadership and commitment to equity. The Campaign for Education Equity has been working to close the gap in access and achievement uh, among more America's more um, advantaged and least advantaged students. And uh, Michael joined us in 2005 as a professor of law and educational practice to launch the campaign just after he successfully litigated the landmark school finance funding suit, CFE versus State of New York. The TC community welcomed Michael as an internationally known educational law scholar and one of the nation's foremost educational litigators, and he's widely respected for his tenacity and brilliance in the pursuit of educational justice for all students. As Michael said, the campaign combines rigorous analysis with vigorous advocacy, research, policy development, and coalition building. And its many victories over the years have demonstrated again and again that equity in education is both affordable and achievable if only we commit to it. Under Michael's leadership, this effort's had many successes in both in the courts and in the court of public opinion. 
but it's a continuing battle and it's not gonna be won until we can say uh, that the educational rights of all children, regardless of background, zip code, political climate, race, anything, are being met. Today's event showcases the campaign's newest public engagement initiative, Know Your Educational Rights, which provides research-based information and tools to those most affected by educational inequities and rights violations, students and parents. I hope you had a chance to visit the learning stations and experience firsthand the interactive resources. The play to be presented this evening is written and performed by high school students, many from the zip code 10467, and it makes clear the power and eloquence of students as advocates. I wanna thank you all for being here in support of the Campaign for Educational Equity, and I want to acknowledge Jessica Wolf, Policy Research Director of the campaign for all she's done to bring us to this moment. I'm very pleased now to introduce Joe Rogers, Jr., who graduated from Teachers College in 2009 with a master's in education leadership policy and politics. He joined the campaign five years ago and serves as director of public engagement and as senior researcher. He believes very strongly that changes needed to bring about educational equity will happen only with authentic community engagement. And tonight's event is a testament to the passion and enthusiasm Joe and the entire team at the campaign bring to their work. So thank you, have a great evening, and here's Joe. Good evening, thank you, uh, thank you President Susan Furman for the introduction and for being here tonight and demonstrating your commitment to our students and to uh, this work. Uh, a couple more thank yous here uh, before we get into the real reason uh, most of you are here. Uh, I wanna thank um, our faculty co-sponsors of this event. Uh, we got a wonderful grant to help underwrite some of the expenses here this evening, food and otherwise, from the Office of Diversity and Community Affairs, which is led by Vice President, jo um, well, I gave her a promotion. Vice President Janice Robinson and the director uh, of the office is uh, Jolene Lane. So I wanna thank them for their uh, financial support of this event and, and uh, allowing us to make it happen. So a round of applause for the Office of Diversity and Community Affairs and their team. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, TC's events uh, department here. They have worked tirelessly over the past several weeks and have worked very closely with our team to pull us together and have done an outstanding job. So I wanna thank especially uh, Linda Colcahoon and Trish McNicholas of the events and development offices for uh, their support. Um, I also, yes, please. I wanna thank uh, my colleagues, my fellow staff members of the campaign, and also we had a, a wonderful group of volunteers tonight who either ushered you in or uh, handed you programs or uh, guided you to our translation station or elsewhere tonight. So I wanna thank all of our fellow uh, staff members and volunteers for their support. And then I also want to, um, I do want to recognize a couple of youth organizations in the room here who are doing outstanding work in the community. Um, it's been, in, uh, they've been, insp they've inspired me. And uh, this conversation here today, this play and this conversation are really about the role of our young people, uh, the leadership roles of our young people in advancing um, educational equity and in the fight for educational justice. And so I wanna thank, first of all, the Brotherhood Sister Soul here in Harlem for coming out with Bro Sis in the back. Um, and I want to thank our friends also from the Point in the uh, South Bronx, from Hunts Point. There's a Point somewhere here. Right here. And finally, in terms of the thank yous, I want to thank those of you who donated to our year-end campaign uh, a couple months ago. You know, your support is instrumental in allowing us to do this work. Um, and we hope to secure additional support in the near future to be able to meet the growing demand for um, uh, the research-based uh, supports that we provide to youth groups, uh, parent groups, and community groups. So thank you again for your support, those of you who have donated to date, and I'm gonna mention a little bit later, more specifically, how those of you who might like to contribute can do so. So stay tuned for that. Um, so now I know um, none of you came here for a lecture tonight, uh, and uh, most of you came here for a play, some of you came here for a discussion about youth activism and education. But first I wanna give you a little more background information um, and then we'll get right to the, uh, to the point. So in 2006, after local parents 
Uh, many of them were parents here in West Harlem on up to Washington Heights and Inwood. 2006, they won a major legal victory. And they did that with the support of lawyers like Michael Rebell, who was co-counsel on the case, um, and, and a, a major law firm and some other support. But it was parents aided by these lawyers who won this battle after 13 years in court. That court case, as many of you know, is called the Campaign for Fiscal Equity versus the State of New York. Essentially what the Court of Appeals, the highest court in the land said after that 13 year legal battle is that New York State's government, you are violating the constitutional rights under state law. You're violating the rights of our young people in this state, specifically here in New York City. You must comply with the law and you must provide at least the basic opportunities to which young people are entitled under state law. Uh, and that was to be to the tune of over $5 billion a year and additional educational resources for New York City alone. There's additional building aid and what have you. We won't get into the specifics, specifics of that. They started to phase in that remedy. They started to provide the money. They stopped after year two, supposed to be phased in over four years, and they cried broke. What they said, it was during the recession. Not, you know, a lot of people didn't have as much money. The state uh, said, you know, we, we know we're on the hook to provide these supports, but you know, just give us a few more years. We're gonna get to those constitutional rights you know, when we get a little more cash. The problem with that, as you can imagine, is that constitutional rights don't dissipate in a tough economic climate. Children's rights do not go away. You cannot sweep them under the rug conveniently until you're ready to pony up. You must find the resources um, that underwrite, that support uh, high quality educational opportunities in our public schools around the state. And to date, the legislature has not done that. Our state government has not done that. And they didn't, they didn't do the research uh, that they would have needed to do in order to determine whether young people in our schools uh, were receiving any of these basic opportunities. So um, there was a, we did that research as the Campaign for Educational Equity um, with Mike, under Michael's leadership. And we pulled together for the first time ever a compendium or, or a collection of educational rights under New York State law. And that included uh, students' rights in every subject area and every social support area for the first time ever. And that document is called Essential Resources. And I encourage you to download it as a PDF from our website, which is equitycampaign.org, equitycampaign.org. Around the same time, we decided that we need to go into the schools, right? It's a bright idea, actually go into the schools to find out what was happening and to find out how these, uh, these budget cuts were affecting students and educators on a daily basis. So we launched an 18 month study that took us all around New York State. I went up to cow country on the Canadian border to small rural districts. We went to suburban districts, small city districts, two large urban districts, including New York City. Uh, and here in the city, we visited 12 schools uh, across all five boroughs. And what we found won't shock any of you who have spent time in schools, whether you're young people, whether you're students, whether you're educators, or maybe some researchers and certainly parents as well who spend time in schools, uh, we found um, that schools weren't able to provide extra tutoring that they must provide under state law when students are not meeting state standards. They have actually have a constitutional legal right to additional tutoring and instructional support. They weren't, schools weren't providing that. Basic supplies, technology, textbooks that were up to date. Who wants a six year old, uh, you know, it's, well we've had President Obama in office for a couple of terms now, but at the time when we did this study, there were textbooks that had the last president. We're teaching social studies and our young people don't have accurate information. Why? Not because their schools don't like them or are evil or they don't want to give uh, children their, their due, but because they didn't have the resources to do this and to do it well in the way that our young people deser deserve. And you'll see that dramatized in 10467, uh, which we're about to watch. Um, if you read the report uh, that, that uh, captures our findings from that study, it's called Deficient Resources. Um, it's also available at equitycampaign.org. Don't read it before you go to sleep. It'll give you indigestion or nightmares. Uh, but the reality is that our young people were in these schools that are under-resourced. They're living a nightmare every day that we as a society, we as a state, we as our state government is not providing the basics. Um, and we need to live with that and we need to do something about it. And that's why um, the voices of these young people and their work is so important here. Uh, a little more of my adult voice, just one more second. Um, we realize when we produce these major reports that are very dense and full of legal language and policy wonkishness, 
that the average student or parent isn't necessarily going to be able to use these to advocate, to find out what their rights are, and then to advocate to make sure that our schools are providing these supports. So we began to break these rights down into user-friendly or bite-sized chunks. Uh, we created these handouts that we called the Know Your Educational Rights Handout Series. We've produced about 10 so far. They're also available on our website at equitycampaign.org under publications. And we encourage you to download them and share them, especially if you're a parent, if you're a student and educator. We want everyone to know about our young people's rights. And this, is, this was our effort in order to make this information more accessible than you might find in a policy report or some very dense research document um, that doesn't necessarily get shared beyond the confines of, acad uh, of academic institutions. Um, so that's that. And we use these documents, these user-friendly handouts and the workshops we conducted um, had the pleasure of facilitating in collaboration with Equi uh, Epic Theater Ensemble, our partners for tonight's, uh, one of our partners for tonight's event. Um, and the young people took the information, they took uh, a little bit of guidance around who's responsible for uh, their rights or for honoring their rights and for addressing rights violations. And uh, with that, I'd like to bring up one of the students, uh, one of the, the most uh, vocal and outstanding and insightful students, and there are many of them in this troop. But I want to introduce you to Vanessa Martinez and, and ask her to join me here on the stage. So Vanessa is a high school senior in the Bronx and uh, she helped create this play that's about to rock your world. So thank you, Vanessa. Hi. Um, so my name is Vanessa Martinez. I'm from one of the three schools that Epic Theater Ensemble um, is a part of. I'm from Bronx High School for Writing and Communication Arts. As Joe said, we researched it, we wrote it, the characters are all based off of someone that we know, or they're based off of our voices that were never heard. So this is our way of saying, this is what's happening around us, this is our response, and this is exactly what we think is going to happen. So I hope you guys enjoy the show. That's all I got to say. And next, uh, I know there are a lot of parent, there are several at least parent activists in the room, uh, parents who are active here in this community, in fact. And I'd like to bring up another dear partner of ours uh, who participates in or collaborates with us in this Know Your Educational Rights uh, initiative. Uh, we have a, a youth engagement arm or youth activism arm, and we also have a parent engagement initiative. And I'd like to invite up to the stage now Dr. Renee Young, who is the parent facilitator uh, of the Adelaide Sanford Institute's Parent Leadership Institute, based in central Brooklyn. And for the past about, really it started about 10 months ago, we first had, uh, we came and we talked about educational rights and gave a brief overview. And uh, we sat down with Dr. Young, who's an amazing veteran educator. I guess once you're an educator, you're never really a veteran. You're still in the, in the trenches. But she's an amazing um, a leader. She believes deeply in the power of youth activism and parent activism and parent leadership. And I want to invite her to just share a few words about the, the work that she's doing um, in Brooklyn, central Brooklyn, and that we're doing together um, uh, to make sure parents also have the information they need to advocate. So Dr. Renee Young. Thank you, Joe, for those kind words. Good evening. The play that you're going to see documents very clearly the lack of educational resources in schools and underserved communities. Now, these, uh, situ this situation is longstanding, widespread. Um, Big difference, <laughs> big difference. Uh, the uh, situation is longstanding, widespread, and I believe criminal. The play will also show you what can happen when students have a voice, have an opportunity for leadership, and can engage in their own development. All are critical to affect change. Youth activism is clearly key. So what is the solution 
to the lack of educational resources. I believe, and I believe this sincerely, that parent advocacy and youth activism spell power. And it is our only hope and our last hope. So the backdrop for this play is the partnership between CEE and PLI, and that's the Parent Leadership Institute. That is why we formed our partnership. Now, the Parent Leadership Institute, and we have parents here tonight from this institute, and I want them to stand and be acknowledged. Come on, stand up. <laughs> They came all the way from Central Brooklyn. Give them another round of applause. <laughs> For the last five years, we have helped parents in Central Bro Brooklyn support and supplement their children's education. Our goal is to improve student achievement. That is our goal. But one parenting component was missing, and it may have been the most important component, and that was knowledge of students' rights. What are our students entitled to, as Joe so eloquently described, under state law? So we formed this partnership to inform the parents in Brooklyn about their rights as it relates to their children's education. So we have embarked on a journey where we have provided informative sessions for our parents. And it reflects three verbs, link, learn, lead. Say that with me, link, learn, lead, link, Learn, lead. I can't help it. I can't. I, that's, that's what I do. That's what I do. The first is link. That means parents have to join together. It's not going to take one or two. You, one or two parents, one parent here, one, it's not going to make a difference. They have to link together. They have to learn. They have to learn all of the laws. And once they get that knowledge, what their children are entitled to, they have to do something with it. They have to share it. They have to develop a plan of action. And then they lead. And how do they lead? They engage other parent groups, community education councils, PTA uh, groups, churches, civic organizations. And they come together. And very key, they persist. They don't give up. It's not about one march or one rally. It's about doing this over a long period of time. And then they must come together to pressure elected officials or any other major stakeholders in the process. And I know if we do this, I believe this sincerely, we will win. We have to win because these are our children. This is our future. And there is no greater asset than our children. And I thank you, Joe Rogers, for your time, your expertise coming to Brooklyn on the train, and your commitment to these goals. I thank you. Uh, so the, the, the other stakeholder, there are many stakeholder groups, but one of them that you didn't hear about, and I want to make sure we recognize them, because they also helped make this possible here this evening, is um, teachers. Any teachers, former teachers, current teachers, et cetera? A number of you. So we have probably maybe a good 15, 20% of teachers in the room. I want to thank two teachers who uh, saw the brilliance of these young people when they came to the National Black Theater performance back in August of 2015. Uh, the, it premiered there on August 31st, I think it was. And two educators from Teachers College, besides Michael, of course, uh, our executive director, were there. Um, and they were so excited about this. They said, we want to take it to TC. We want to take it wherever we can take it. We want to take it to DC. 
and those educators, at least one of them is here this evening, one is abroad. Um, Dr. Michelle Knight-Manuel is here in the front row with her husband. I wanna thank her for her enthusiasm and, and for recognizing the power of this work and for seeing the value of connecting teachers, educators, uh, teachers and students and, uh, and other community members in fighting for educational justice. Uh, and because of Michelle, we're taking this down to the American Educational Research Association Centennial Conference, or 100-year conference down in DC in two weeks. Um, so we're taking what's now been a very local issue to the national stage. Um, and we have Michelle to thank, or Dr. Knight Manuel, if you will. She was my professor, so I go back and forth now, uh, the formal and informal. Um, but I also want to thank Dr. Yolanda Seeley Ruiz, who's also a professor here, a faculty member. Many of you know her. Another educator, amazing educator who's committed to social justice. She's in Paris with her daughter, I believe, at the moment, so she couldn't be here, but she helped make it happen. Finally, I promise, finally, finally. Um, uh, in eighth grade, I gave a speech at a New England oratorical contest. Uh, and I, I, my speech was about educational excellence and equity. And I won a $1,500 college scholarship uh, for winning that New England contest. Uh, but I will tell you that the young people you're about to see here, especially the seniors, they've already won scholarships through their work with Epic and through these kinds of performances uh, $40,000, $50,000, $60,000 scholarships, full ride because of their hard work, their brilliance and their intelligence and their commitment. Um, and you know, whereas I won a little, I won a little scholarship and I won a little, a little bit of respect that day, uh, these young people are gonna win your laughs, they're gonna win your heart, they're gonna win inspiration, you're gonna walk out of here being f fired up, to take action, and they're gonna inform you. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, the powerful play 10467. My zip code can't be the cause of my inequity. My skin color can't be the only thing that they see. You've been beaten by the bushes because we ain't bright, but we gonna fight to the pipe because it's all right. But we can see the weakness weeping from the window pane. So I expect Donald Trump to be the main. You say the horse can't be forced to drink the water. Well, I say force is the cause, so push harder. Yes, sir. As a member of the Board of Regents, I understand that my job is... Well, yes, I understand that the schools in that zip code have not shown the necessary results. But what you're forgetting is that these schools also need additional aid. They need newer textbooks, adequately trained teachers. Sir, are you not capable of understanding this? These young adults are our future. Yes, sir, I comprehend what you're telling me. Yes, sir. But I still believe the schools in Westchester no longer require the successive. The inner city schools need more than the. Equality is not the word for it. it. Equity. They need equity. They need more than the same amount because the schools of state started out ahead. And the inner city schools cannot be expected to catch up with some kind of extra help. Well, sir, you need to realize that everyone can leave the city and move upstate. They don't have that option. But they still want the children to get a powerful education. If we want to make it accessible for all. Sir? Sir? Politicians turn to politricksters, pulling the same trick. How much money we gonna make of you fools is what they think. Doing everything they can to make sure that they stay on top. I pray to God that these fools will never step foot on my block. You don't know how good we should have it. These ain't some luxuries we should have. Don't put them into the back burner. They wanna make us broke and stupid so we can make it out, whether it's making it to college or taking a bus route. But I promise you I won't get inequity, get the best of me. Brothers are killing brothers and living just for a check, you see. We are all born, we live, we sleep, and we die in the same class. It's kind of like Hinduism. A class system turned to a caste system. What's the issue? We're focused on building buildings instead of building our future. It's us. We stay silent. It's us. Hey, what's up, man? Man, nothing much. Yo, but check it. Watch how these teachers saw something because I don't have a notebook. I mean, that's nothing new, man. You already know how they are. I mean, yeah, but check it. I mean, why they expect me to have notebooks if nobody's giving them to me? I mean, what am I taking notes on? Them raggedy ass textbooks from like 20 years ago? The ones that have like 200 pages missing on them and got tags on all the rest of them? Yeah, I feel you, man. I feel you. Yeah, but like I said, I ain't gonna stress. I mean, 
I feel like something bad's gonna happen to me today, but like I said, I ain't gonna stress. All right, so what are you gonna do? Boy, I'm gonna go to class, and I'm gonna ask for some pen and some paper for that fine shorty with the fat, I mean, with the glasses, you know what I'm saying? How much longer am I supposed to be We don't class? have the needed I'm support staff to, to fit these kids in their history. needed classes. I've got 36 kids on the roster. How many of them have I eaten? We have to and offer at least one, one AP course, so hard choices have to be. Look, I am a U.S. history teacher. Half of these kids need an English credit. Why are we all in a finance class? I have responsibility to take care of. Good morning, class. Take out your notebooks, write down your heading. Tyrone, where is your notebook? Where is your notebook? I don't have one, Miss. Montgomery. What? It's Mrs. Montgomery. Hey, oh, Miss, uh, can I get some help with this do now? I don't understand what it's asking me to do. Just take out your notebook. Why am I still in this class? I'm supposed to have an AP credit in English. I don't know I'm in this class. I'm supposed to be a U.S. history Okay, look, you ain't got to call me out like that, miss. I mean, I don't see why I should have my notebook when you guys don't even have your textbooks. Every student in here has a notebook except for you, I, I can't afford to buy another student another Yo. notebook. Can you just ask a student for some paper? Uh, miss, I, I need help with the do now. I, I just don't understand what it's asking me to do. Like, just what is going ask up here for some help. Oh. Tyrone, can you please ask a student Man, for no, paper, No, Miss, no, Miss. Man, you're probably one of those teachers that think I should be like locked up or gunned down by now. But you know what, my GPA is high. GPA is not high. It's not even a reflective. I mean, look, where are the textbooks at, though? Where are the textbooks at, though? I mean, and do what now? Ain't nothing to do. Hey, look, well, Christine, what are we supposed to be doing right now? Beats me. This class has nothing to do with the credit that I need for college. Yes, can I go to the bathroom? Yeah, yeah me too. too. No, you can't go to the bathroom. Just ask a peer for some paper. Just ask a peer for some help. Miss, <coughs> miss, we don't really, really have anything in the classroom, I mean. I mean, it's not his fault we don't have anything here. We don't have textbooks, computers. We don't even have paper in a writing school. <coughs> hey, well, miss, what is finance? Boy! Oh my God. <laughs> Tyrone, Principal Gordon wants to see you. I mean, that clown will fool. Watch your mouth, miss. You know I think you're a good kid and all, but you're sending a wrong message to them. Give me the bag. Hell no. Stop. Yo, why am I in trouble already? I mean, I've only been in school for one period. Like, what? Give me the damn bag. Stop. Ain't nothing in my bag, yo. Come on. It's just poems. Tyrone. No, no. I'm here trying to get your work because I didn't really understand it. Granted, I, I, I could have paid more attention, but you were so busy handling that situation, I literally could have fired off a bullet in class and you wouldn't have noticed. Now, I don't know what it is, but I can't piece together most of what I hear in your class. Not that you're a bad teacher. I, I'm not saying that. It's just that I, I can't think as well as I can speak. That's an issue you should bring up to the counselor. Wow. Really? So you dead ass just don't care at all? Look, Nicholas, if you can't pay attention in class, you can't expect me to give you a summary of the lesson. Well, miss, sometimes with you a summary is the lesson. Excuse me, Nicholas. Lena, my finance class isn't working. I have a meeting with the parents. Um. <laughs> the minimally adequate players present Oh, literally adequate poem. How now, brown cow? 
Sebastian. She has, she never has any work for me. I mean, she won't even give me a single sheet of paper. I mean, she acts like it's a crime for me to ask for a single sheet of paper. Or is that just for a student like me? Oh, why is he in here? He doesn't understand the work, no how. I mean, I do understand the work. It's just that nobody ever gives me a chance. I was only in school for one period before these clowns took me out. One period, all because Principal Gordon had been in for and that's when I went straight home. Felt as blind as ever because they got my bag and my glasses. That's when I went straight home. 
I mean, it's not like anybody's ever really there anyway. The Minimally Adequate Players present a minimally adequate children's story. Once upon a time, a dog went outside. He died. <laughs> This Montgomery should not be teaching that class. Oh, Miss Samuel, she should be teaching that class. She can teach anything. But, yeah, he isn't even going to be coming back. To the newspaper club? To mm -hmm. school. I heard about it, but not enough information. We have a paper to about Friday. How about the rats that are hiding on the walls? Who wants to see them, but we don't need that kind of news. How about this breaking news? Another poll from our lovely gymnatorium has fallen on another student. That kid should have seen what she was going. Pop, 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 pop. Attention! We wrote that two weeks ago. <laughs> Today seems like a slow day, so how about we take a look at the... Question slash suggestion box! <laughs> Standards so much so that we, when we get anything from them, it's considered enough. That we go complacent, thinking that we ain't shit simply because we're young. And so we're told to shut up. So we're told to shut up. What does complacent mean? Got you. Showing small or uncritical satisfaction with oneself or one's achievements. Alright, uh, so it's like when you ace the test but you're not on the honor roll? No, it's more like if you say, I get good grades, but you got 65 average. What do you say? <laughs> I, I think that should be <laughs> No, I think the kid in the paper was talking about being shut down when we know we have more to say. What this kid is getting at, what we should be getting at, is that our standards are so low that we're supposed to appreciate an educational system that is barely okay. I like that. Barely okay. I have two teachers that are barely okay. But isn't what this kid is saying is that makes us fairly okay students? Yo, we have to look into this. They say about standards, but who sets them? Fairly okay is starting to sound like a punchline to some kind of joke. And maybe worth a joke. How do we even look into it? We barely even know what we're looking for. We could study up. We know how to research a story. My dad always told me, gotta be prepared with the information if you want to change the situation. If we want to tackle this, we're gonna start to, we're gonna have to find out what's causing schools to fail. And what makes some schools better than others to see the difference between the two? How schools look, staff, the supplies, because I'm pretty sure not all schools have a gym of I've never seen that with no <laughs> I could start looking into how much state funding a school doesn't spend in a year. Maybe you could try to set up I like that. I'll ask my dad to see if anyone he knows. Please don't give me an interview with Miss Lattimore or a teacher from the PTA. They look at us with pity eyes. I want a region council or a city board up in here. I want the dead eyes full of facts. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I'll ask my dad who we, to see who we can try to contact. In the meanwhile, we have to start figuring out why we all sense the standards are lower and no one is talking about it. The Minimally Adequate Players present a Minimally Adequate Love Song. I had 
to stay in school and get the grades. If I got anything below an 85, she'd take my paintbrushes away. If I got in trouble with the teacher, she'd sit me down and tell me that the teachers were there for me, pouring their hearts out into mine to make sure the goal of school was realized in my life. That goal was to make sure the next generation will be able, capable of owning a bright future. I, I took my mom's words seriously. I also didn't want her to take my things away. So I worked hard, studied, and passed. Despite all that, I never did find the right teacher who would lead me to my bright future. There is no art teacher at our school. No one to show me what pointillism is, who Matisse and Van Gogh are. I had to do that on my own, and I did. But when it came time to enter that big school scholarship, I couldn't submit any work. You need your art teacher to sign the submission form. No big scholarship for college, no dreams. So technically, our school failed. Or was my mom just wrong? Oh, Nicholas, she's just trying to help you. She wants a counselor to help me? Do I have a sign on my back that says, please save this little brown kid? Ms. Montgomery's underqualified and she doesn't want to help us out anyhow. She's going to go to school, forget college, and maybe get a job and put some money in my mom's hand. I mean, I'm no charity case, but why can't we get the basic things we need? Like paper and pencil, so that way when I have to hear, when I have to ask for some, I don't have to hear the teacher's lame response. I'm not stable. <laughs> Education is free, but this rate is not even standard. I mean, my mom, she can't help me out with supplies. I, she's. I come to school to learn, but I can't face the chewed up pencils and crashing computers. It's not my battle to fight. I just know I gotta get out of here. The Minimally Adequate Players present a Minimally Adequate Fire Safety Lesson.
my name is Christine Diaz. Hello, my name is Margaret Chandler. Wow. Would it kill you to shake my hand? It's only common courtesy. Don't worry. I'll reach out my hand to you too. Not all city kids are rude. Hello, my name is Christine Diaz. Hello, my name is Margaret Chandler. It's a pleasure to meet you, Miss Chandler. It's a pleasure to be you too, Miss Diaz. Thanks, smiles already. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be you too, Miss Diaz. Ah, uh, right, Miss Chandler. Um, I'll be taking down some notes. It's only for my reference. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, no problem. <laughs> How do I say this so I don't offend you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like you. <laughs> well, what is your job? It's a very complicated job. I have I have a lot of responsibilities. I can't explain to myself. It's a very complicated job I have. I can't possibly explain all at this meeting. Okay, great. Um, next question. Oh, our school has a gym auditorium. That's what they call it. It's a gym and an auditorium together. So when you're trying to play basketball, you have to watch out for the poles that support the auditorium. So, in your opinion, so in your opinion, what are the adequate steps being taken to ensure that New York City students have the adequate facilities that we need in order to play basketball and do theater, just not in the same way? <coughs> um, that's a very good question. Give me your name and number, and I'll get back to you. I don't think. I think your questions is one of those questions you need to ask a direct representative of New York City. The state has nothing to do with this. I mean, we do, you know. <laughs> I think your questions is one of those questions you need to ask a direct representative of New York City. The state has nothing to do with this. That's not my department. We oversee the department. But the city runs the facilities. I don't think that's underneath the New York State's I don't believe you need to ask the mate. He'll be able to give you more of a pizza. The state does provide money for education, just not for the Bronx. But we, the city, the state needs money for necessities such as preparing roads, make the state improve, everything that makes the state So, New York City schools are a part, a very small part of what the state will fund. Do you realize how? Excuse my language. How fucking stupid you sound. <laughs> You'd rather waste money on repairing the roads rather than on Why can you both send me something? I When your generation is done, my generation will take over. Except we will be less educated because some morons decided to visit the ball. Politicians are paid to lie. Oh. Bureaucrats are paid to lie. They are the. 
biggest bullshitters ever. Politicians get elected by promising the people ideas that seem amazing at the time. And as soon as they get elected, they hire these bureaucrats to say that they never said those things. But in that moment, she was real. She's right. I tried to uncover the big story. I tried to get her to tell me something that wasn't there. But you see, that's the problem. If no one speaks up, then who will? The silence can become quite violent. That's probably the most realest thing I would ever hear a bureaucrat say. We won't catch the media pulling her on that. They'd rather run some dumb shit Donald Trump says. Money makes them all go wrong, right? Yeah, so one of the things that we learned from the research and interviews, I asked Regent Thompson, are schools better now than when you were coming up during the civil rights movement? The one thing that's the same are the children. You know, young people are young people. They all have aspirations. They want to go on and do great things. Some of them are not always as clear as to how to do it, but I've never met a young person that didn't want to do well. So, to answer your question, particularly if you are poor <coughs> and of color, it is actually worse. All these kids in urban, underfunded areas, they caught up in who they are and what society wants them to be. When you feel out of place, you start to withdraw. I asked my dad if the legislator was responsible. The legislature? <laughs> They support their kids, but not ours, especially my child. Us parents can even do anything because we're a bunch of insects to them. The government, we're all in poverty and they're watching us rot. How do we change things? I don't want to participate in the blame game. It does nothing for me, for us. It only allows those who don't want to take part of this calamity. We are all responsible. Should every child have equity? Yes. But is every problem in this world going to be addressed? This mentality is already planted in the voices of the children whose equity level is hidden. And sadly, my mentality is the same. We can give them the resources, but we can't make them oblige to the future. You don't have any grants that has the right to get money for the school. I continue to write them, though. Because to be an assistant principal, you have to have resilience. You can't just complain that the education system is messed up and not do anything about it. Ain't nobody gonna make provisions so that your child can have a meaningful education. You have to make do when you have absolutely nothing. One of my interviewees pointed me to a recent lawsuit, campaign for fiscal equity versus state of New York. A Supreme Court, a Supreme Court judge said that students have constitutional rights to a sound basic education. Children are entitled to minimally adequate physical facilities and classrooms which provide enough light, space, heat, and air to permit these children to learn. The gymatorium, holy oh, shit! Oh no, I'm a privilege! Enough air. I never knew air was a privilege since it's minimally adequate, right? <laughs> Fairly okay. No? <laughs> Children should also have access to minimally adequate instrumentalities of learning, such as desks, chairs, pencils, and reasonably current textbooks. I mean, according to our textbooks, Richard Nixon is still our president. <laughs> this is my favorite. Children are also entitled to minimally adequate teaching of reasonably up-to-date curriculum, such as reading, writing, mathematics, science, and social studies, by sufficient personnel adequately trained to teach those subject areas. Do you think our teachers know about this? <laughs> I highly doubt it. We have to interrupt that town hall meeting today. It's mandatory because Regent Andre Thompson and the superintendent are going to be there. And that baseball player that used to go here. And it's time that the parents stepped up. Oh! <laughs> Baby.
As you know, Dr. Regent Thompson will be coming oh, to present. Dr. <laughs> yes, Dr. Regent Thompson will be coming to present us with a certificate of progress for all the hard work that we've accomplished over the past few years. As a treat, Principal Gordon has brought back an alum that has done us very, very proud. Hello students, we are all here today to hear from someone quite famous. He is a famous basketball, baseball player who went to our school. Here he is now, Anthony Lopez. Hi, Why not amazing? That's how you guys should feel. Let me tell you guys a story. It was 1995, right here in the Bronx. 104-67. I was walking past a fancy restaurant, and there was an alley behind that restaurant. So I walked toward the restaurant. I walked toward the alley. I looked in the alley. I heard a sound in the alley. And what do you think I saw? What do you think I saw? Tell me. What do you think I saw in the alley? What do you think I saw in the alley? What do you think I saw in the alley? No, 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 no. I saw a man eating another man. He looked up at me and he said, yes, is there a problem? I said, yeah, ain't no problem. As long as you give me a leg. And we ate that man. I said, yeah. The point of the story is, you have to want it. If you want it, you'll get it. You want it. You have to want success. You have to want success when you want to breathe. You have to want success when you want to sleep. You have to want success when you want to eat. How they need to eat. No! You have to want success when you want to shower, shave, or, or clip your toenails. How they need all of those. All right. All right. I can't wait for someone to give you something in life. <laughs> You have to go out and get it yourself. You have to go out and get your own education. Your school doesn't serve lunch, you make your own lunch. Your school doesn't have chairs, you sit on the floor. Your school doesn't have a library, you build the library. Your school has all written history textbooks, you write new history textbooks. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I didn't have all the breaks. It took me 16 and years and months, 16, <laughs> to get a high school diploma. I didn't go to college, real college. You don't need to go to college when you got this philosophy. <laughs> Stop sleeping on the streets! <laughs> Stop sleeping at your mom's house! <laughs> or your grandma's house! <laughs> to my conclusion, I was going to give you guys money. I was going to give you guys a 
a donation. But you know what? The schools don't need money. You guys need accountability. You guys don't need money. You guys need motivation. I just gave you motivation. You're welcome. I love you. Dr. Thompson alive, I want to remind you that your thoughts and your questions will be recorded and given to the State Education Department. So please, best self. If you want to speak out, that's fine. Yeah, I got a question. What is it? I try and I try and I try, but I know I'm not getting the education that I need. My younger siblings are in middle school. And they're getting the stuff that my class is learning now. They're 12 and 13. I'm 17. So, do I just stay and get the education that a middle school is getting? Or do I just drop out? Maybe if you kept your test plus high, you'd be learning on high curriculum. My boy Andrew failed several classes, and I'm telling him to pay attention. Well, don't look like he pay attention enough. What we need to be worried about is the quality of these bad zones. Why blame the students for all these educational problems? Yes, the, uh, yes, the... Appearance is an, a very important factor. Yes, the appearance is a very important factor. But what's more important, the students pee or the resources we need to learn? Listen, the government is giving us the same amount as every other school. We are all equal in this system. Stop sharing the money equally between all the schools. Our school needs more money than the other schools. Just a couple miles away. The problem isn't the money. The problem is the students who are not meeting us halfway. I did not have a great education. But the background of a struggle makes you stronger. I was hungry for books. But my school didn't have them. So I had to walk an hour and then. Listen, 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 listen. <laughs> I, can't, I can process the information given me pretty well if I have enough one-on-one -on -one attention. But what teachers like this about Gilmore right over there, don't have no time for you let me know you made. I'm going to talk you all your other time so you get a decent break. All I need is for you to listen. You're hurting me. You're hurting us. We do not see that. We love you. We don't want to see you end up in the streets and selling drugs. Stop making this guilty. Uh, excuse me. I, I have something to say. Uh, uh, my name is DeAndre. And I think you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Is it the students' fault for not having enough resources? Yes. Is it the students' fault for having less student relaxes? I don't think so. These problems are not the students' responsibility. It's the principals. It's the Department of Education. It's the government's responsibility to keep the students, my daughter, educated and be ready for college. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I work in two jobs. Two jobs. I work in. I work for UPS as a pack deliverer, and I have to take shifts in the grocery store. I work my ass off bringing the bread to the table, paying the bills, and saving money for my daughter's college funds. We don't want our children to fail and be unsuccessful because failure is not the option. Ooh. Ooh. I think I feel Jesus coming. <laughs> I mean, uh, how can you learn to wait up when you fail? How can you understand the work uh, without tutoring? Not why are we standing down when we should be standing up? We got to stand up. Uh, Better, well, if I don't do better for my daughter, then that's my fault. 
And I'm not going to let that happen. That's all I got to say. Now, the superintendent and Regent Dr. Thompson are here. So please, keep your criticism to yourself. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Yeah! All right, everyone, quiet down. Now, the superintendent and Regent Dr. Thompson are here. I am very pleased to say that this school has made significant educational progress over the past three years, according to the state standards. It's good to know that things are finally improving. Are you gonna stop this? What do you suggest? We can just drag them out, can we? Civics was never my strong point. Seniors, keep it down and that's where we will take away that AP English class that you all have been screaming about. Not enough! Not enough! Control your kids, the press is here! I'm getting security. Dr. Thompson! <laughs> but I will not tolerate this type of behavior in my school. Remove that. We just want to stay in the system we are a and, part of. And I completely agree. Unhand that chance! <laughs> Principal Gordon, you may have forgotten that New York City is a part of New York State. Whoa. And New York State <laughs> is a part of the United States. Whoa. And in the United States, <laughs> we have a little thing called the Constitution. Oh. 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 The <laughs> and it serves to protect the rights of every American citizen through representation. Yes, but they are just kids. Kids don't vote. And the judiciary. These citizens must be protected regardless of their age. Yes! Yes! <laughs> Principal Gordon, how about you and me have a little chat? with my superiors. You think we're standing down? We're gonna stand up, cause we ain't going back to be a screw up. You think we're standing down? We're gonna stand up, cause we ain't going back to be a screw up. You think we're Thompson got stuck in Albany. 
he won't be coming and there will be no suspension. Oh my God, everybody just keeps breaking Ms. Lattimore's heart. Who are you going? There ain't no cavalry coming, it's us. Stay silent. It's us. Who here is a student? Stand up. Who cares? Stand up, please. Who here is a parent? Stand up. Who here lives in New York? You have to stand up. Why do we stand down? Why do we stand down? Why do we stand down? Why do we stand up?